mean to be the University Presbyterian Church here in Sacramento? Uh, the church began, as, uh, as you're aware, just in case you forgot, as a result of um, <laughs> the Fremont Presbyterian Church making a decision to leave the PCUSA and join the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. That decision was a long time coming, believing the leadership believing that that better reflected uh, their theological position. However, many members of Fremont did, did not want to do this. Um, many of those uh, are among you, feeling that the EPC did not reflect their point of view. So this group decided to continue in tr- the tradition of the PCUSA and took the new name University Presbyterian. So that's the background. And... Um, We've been in this study now for several weeks, and we're trying to do two things. First of all, we are trying to provide some kind of foundational understanding or reasons for your position, your stand. Um, that's the first thing we're trying to do. Give a, a, uh, an understanding, a sense of, uh, or a, an apologetic, if you will, that, the, that this stand was a, both a legitimate and biblical choice. So we're clarifying what has happened. The second thing is to give us a sense of who we are so we can better know, about, uh, know what we're called to do. So who we are and, and what we're going to do together. And you're all going to be a part of that, just as I hope you're a part of this conversation. Um, I know we're used to one-way conversations. If we had an extra hour every Sunday, I would just sort of stop in the middle and have you ask questions and make comments and, you know, discuss, because it's fresh in your mind after I've just said stuff. But, you know, by the time you get out and have your cookie, it's like, (laughs) you know, it's it's gone. So, uh, unfortunately, we, we can't do that. I'm trying to figure out how we can maybe do that in a better way, because I know once while I'm saying it, you probably have thoughts or or ideas or responses, and unfortunately, we haven't figured out how to add it. So we're you know we can wait till Thursday, but you know even more dissipates by Thursday. But uh, hopefully, I'm going to be I'm going to try to write some things up, try to have them on the website, so there can be some additional interaction. Um, it helps probably if you if you sat there with pen in hand, so that um, you could you know, write down any thoughts or questions that that come to your mind. You may have a way to say it that's better than what I'm trying to do. I've called uh, the study Another Way of Seeing. And because of our history, I'm contrasting the belief system of evangelical thinking with the PCUSA thinking or what I'm calling inclusive theology. That's what I'm doing week by week. Um, And I made a particular point to call it another way of seeing. Not the only way, but another way of seeing. Another legitimate biblical way of, of seeing. And I've tried to say over and over again, it's important to note, all our ways of seeing are flawed in one way or another. They're all human attempts to try to gain understanding about the way things are. And so it's just our effort. Nobody has perfect vision on this. It's also why it's called a conversation. Because Um, Even among ourselves, uh, this is the way we learn from each other. Even when we see things differently, it's it's the way we learn as we discuss those those items. So, with that introduction, I'm going to read our text for this morning. This is from the lectionary. It's Matthew 14, verses 13 through 21. Very common and um, familiar story. In the book of Matthew. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place. And the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. 
And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and two fish. He looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is part three in our study of the vast topic of salvation. I have not completed the study of salvation in three weeks. It goes throughout the Bible. There's so many aspects and so many parts to it, but I've tried to... To, um, to, to just sort of um, focus in on some of the main distinctives between the evangelical way of thinking and what I've called inclusive theology of the PCUSA. And so far, we've done three major distinctives. Now, if I was teaching a class, I would ask you, and we'd have a little, we'd have a little oral exam, you know, what are the three distinctives that we have already discussed, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to tell you what they are. (laughs) All right. So distinctive number one, very quickly, salvation and evangelical thinking is mostly about getting into heaven after you die or avoiding hell. Mostly it's about, it's not the only thing it's about, but the primary focus, if you've grown up in any kind of evangelical situation uh, in your history, you would know that the primary thinking or the primary focus is getting into heaven after you die and avoiding hell. And you do this by a full and sincere repentance, which is you are very, very sorry for all of the ways you've been wrong and how bad you've been, and you make a profession of faith, which means asking Jesus into your heart or trusting Christ or making a decision for Christ or um, one of those uh, phrases, And you do that before you die. And if you don't do that correctly, before you die, there is no hope for you. End of story. People are in hell who do not accept Jesus before their death. And by the way, it doesn't matter that you've never heard the story of Jesus either. Okay? Really? Really. Yes, it doesn't matter. You've never heard the story of Jesus either. You are still responsible. They will point to Romans 2, where they talk about all are still, even those without the law, responsible for breaking the law, etc., etc., and assume that because of that, everybody is destined for this uh, eternity in hell apart from making a profession of faith before death. In contrast to this, for the PCUSA, salvation is not about after death primarily, but primarily about the kingdom of God on earth. That's the focus. The focus is about Jesus who has come to establish, we call, sometimes he calls it kingdom of heaven, or sometimes he calls it the kingdom of God, but it is clearly the God's kingdom, God, kingdom, by the way, is God's rule, God's, God having his way in the community That's the the focus of salvation, God bringing his kingdom to earth. Salvation is about God putting us right, putting our communities right, fixing our broken places both in us and in our communities and making us whole on earth every day, right now, in this moment. One of our sermons coming up down the road, I, I won't predict when that will be, sometime, down there, is uh, we will focus on after-death stuff. But right now, I'm just trying to make uh, this important point that the first distinctive, salvation in the PCUSA primarily is about the kingdom of God on earth, for this world. Second distinctive, for evangelicals, salvation happens in a single moment of time. They talk about the salvation experience or the conversion experience. 
referred to as, like I said before, receiving Christ, trusting Christ, and it's usually referred to as being born again. This is the primary, it happens in a moment, at a, at a moment in time, you now talk about yourself as having been saved. Okay? By the way, that comes a lot out of the revival movements of the 17th and 18th centuries, or, yeah, 18th and 19th 1700s and 1800s, there's a couple of revivals that went on, and there was a way of coming into an area, you know, in a, just uh, in an explosive kind of way, and you grab converts, and you bring them forward, and, it's a, and then you move on to the next city. And that was a big, a big part of it, getting saved. And that sort of has sort of con- um, made its way into our American version of evangelicalism. The inclusive theology on the PCUSA, rather, sees salvation as a process, not a single moment, not a moment in time, but something that is ongoing in life. There can be, by the way, there can be experiences with God. I'm not talking that the fact that people have experiences with God, very, very important experiences with God, moments of enlightenment or understanding or whatever. Those, I'm not saying those don't happen. But salvation itself, as in terms of the theology of that term, is about what God is doing in us, around us, and in the world, and invites us to keep noticing and keep participating, as Jesus saying, if anyone has ears to hear, listen. Um, so it's something that's happening within you throughout your lifetime, and we're invited to get involved or to pay attention. Third distinction, very quickly, in evangelical thinking, the purpose of salvation in evangelical thinking is primarily to shape us up, make us better rule keepers, get us to stop sinning, to change our ways. I'm not saying there are not people who, need, who don't need to change their ways. There are some people who really need to change their ways, okay? Uh, it's clearly. That, but, but salvation is not about getting someone to change their ways because that's just, you read Romans, that's someone trying to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. It doesn't work. I mean, you can, you can try to make someone feel guilty, feel responsible. You can talk till you're blue in the face and you're not going to get someone to actually change their behavior by some sort of force from the outside. It's not going to work. And if you, do, if you make salvation about that, then you lose what salvation really is because in inclusive theology, God's work in us is to wake us up. Okay, these are all the theological words. To raise us up with Christ. To help us to find a life that is abundant and full. That's, that's what we need, you see. Because then that, that permeates all the other things and reasons we do what we do. And his work never stops. I, here's, here's something you could sort of write down if you want to. <laughs> I am never not in need of saving. <laughs> okay? I am never not in need of saving. I need help. <laughs> That's it. One of, the, one of those basic prayers is help. I need help. I need help because I'm not perfect. I've got stuff in my life because I have experiences or traumas or things that have happened to me. We all have. We need help. Don't we? Right? Am I the only one? You get okay. Good. All right. Whew. All right. So we, we need help. We need God's work to continue to save us from all the things that happen or that we do, or even choices that we often can make that get us into into a bad way. We need to be rescued. God is a saving God. He is always at work. Okay. Here comes the distinctive for today. I'm going to know I'm going to have to make this really brief. (laughs) In in evangelical theology, salvation is mostly private. That's the fourth distinctive. It's actually very American, to be honest with you. We like private. We are the king of private. We are the individualists. We are the rugged individualists. We conquered the territory. We like competitive. You know, we... We sort of like, I'm more saved than you kind of, kind of talk. You know, we, we, we like this sort of way of thinking. But, but, we, we, uh, but in evangelical theology, salvation is primarily private. It's something that 
God does in each person, individually, privately, and mainly alone, even if you're in a group when it happens, but it mainly happens to you. In fact, it's interesting that most of the scriptures that talk about salvation, we just make an assumption that they're talking about us privately. You ever hear the verse, uh, someone used this with me one time, pray without ceasing? How many of you actually tried to do that individually? Huh? Well, well, I grew up, that's what you were taught to do. You were taught to do that individually, personally. It was my job to pray without ceasing. Well, what if you just heard that communally? So Joe takes 10 minutes, Don takes 10 minutes, Lou takes 10 minutes. You know what I'm saying? So you know, you know, by the time we get around, we've got the whole day covered, right? Why do we assume that everything we read is meant for me alone? Okay, well, that's in in, in some ways salvation. We always assume is just private, just me. In evangelical, in in inclusive theology, salvation happens in and for the community. There is a communal aspect to salvation. There are other cultures better at this than ours. We can learn from other cultures about how to understand things communally. Because it's not a one-time event, but an ongoing process. Because of that, it requires a community, a salvation community, for it to happen. God works through salvation communities to do his work. Eugene Peterson used to say that all salvation is personal, but it is never private. It's not magic. God doesn't sprinkle salvation dust on our heads when we answer the questions correctly. You know, he's kind of waiting with a, some dust over here. And when you get it right, you almost got it, Dick. Almost. You know, and you get it right. Whoo, whoo, I'm in. You know, that's not the picture that we're given. Happens in community. For example, when he wants to teach me about forgiveness, wants to help me with my lack of forgiveness or my, my stuckness with not being able to forgive, he puts me in a, in a community where I can get offended, you know, by other people so that I can learn about forgiveness, so I can grow in forgiveness. You understand? God doesn't just go, forgiveness, you know, like it's some sort of, magical reward that will fall on me if I, I don't know, pray hard enough. God is at work among us to save us and to deliver us. Very important. Let me just say this quick word about community. Uh, Sue and I were flying from Baltimore last few days, and uh, as we're getting to to the airport, our plane was to leave at 5 p.m., and at 4.30 they announced that they were having difficulty with the plane. <laughs> Not something you want to hear when you're about ready to get on that plane. But as the minutes ticked away, we were clearly going to miss our flight, our connection in Kansas City, so we were waiting and waiting, and finally we were feeling frustrated, and we were standing at the desk where you go stand to hope someone will come and rescue you. <laughs> And uh, looking kind of alone. And all of a sudden, we were there at the counter, and we turned around and met a dozen other Californians trying to get to Oakland, where we were flying into. And all, all of a sudden, it changed. Our problem was no longer just ours. It was ours. And it felt different. All of a sudden, it was us against the airlines, you know? <laughs> And um, it, was, it was a shared experience. Community works that way. Communities, community pulls us together. Sometimes it's through difficulty. We're pulled out of, out of our isolation. So the disciples said, we need to send these people away so they can get some food. And Jesus said, no, 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 they don't need to go away. Keep them here. You guys feed them. (laughs) 
And they were like, what? <laughs> Salvation. Salvation, feed, you nourish them, you feed them. Individualism is ingrained in us. It's, um, we have a hard time kind of figuring out this communal aspect of, of salvation. And yet, um, here is Jesus having them sit down, taking these five loaves and two fish, and just breaking them and giving them. See, the nourishment, salvation, the nourishment, the feeding occurred in community together. We forget that. What the PCOSA is discovering is there are many worshiping salvation communities out there that don't have steeples or, or don't have a building or sometimes don't even meet at 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. You know? Go on the website, www.1001.org, and watch some of the videos about some of the new worshiping communities that are coming up that are trying to do this very thing. It's a very interesting thing that's going on, even in our own denomination. So how many people could Jesus have fed that day? Doggone it. Ever have a give a, a party and afraid you're going to run out of food? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what if 6,000 were there? <laughs> Why the 12 baskets full left over? Don't you think that's a funny sort of ending? And they picked up 12 baskets full. Well, I have a theory. My theory is that there's always more. He would have had enough for as many as would come. Come. In other words, it's not, there were no requirements here, no theology exams, no membership required, no. Come eat. This is the Lord's table, right? He has prepared this table for you and for us all. The feeding of the 5,000 is God working in community. That's where God works, in community, among us, among us. So often we're convinced that, um, that this has to happen somehow alone. We have to stay alone. We're not good enough to be a part of the community or whatever. You know, I've met so many people who are involved in these marinerships. I didn't really know about these marinerships until I came here. They're, they're a big thing. Well, you know what? In some ways, they have operated as salvation communities for those of you who are part of them. They have. You have shared your stories, your lives. Your, you've supported one another through this. It hasn't been perfect. You ever get along? You ever have a disagreement with somebody in a marinership? <laughs> of course. It's real life. But that's where God does his work in community.